Since the last time we discussed the Su-57, we had a production ramp-up, the M variant being produced, two-dimensional nozzles, dual-seater variants, drone delivery, loitering munitions, new air-to-ground weapons, and now a constant use in Ukraine. Hmm. I guess it is time to be called a Russian shill again. On this channel, you can find hours of Su-57 content. Nowhere this aircraft has been covered in more detail than here, so I won't repeat everything from the start. At the end of this video, there will be the links to all the previous material, and I invite you to watch it if you haven't already. In this video, we talk about the latest developments about the aircraft, in the same way we recently did for the F-22 upgrades. How many Su-57s are in service now? It is not a straightforward question to answer because the Russians do not declare the numbers when there is a delivery. However, the consensus is as follows. One unit delivered in 2020. Uh, it was supposed to be two, but one crashed during the delivery flight, which was definitely not a good omen. Three units delivered in 2021, six units delivered in 2022, 12 units delivered in 2023. At the beginning of 2023, 22 aircraft were in service, then there was a pause, and then two or three aircraft have been delivered in September 2024. This makes a total of 24 or 25 aircraft in service. One of them has likely been damaged by a Ukrainian drone strike on the Aktyubinsk Air Base, but otherwise there are no recorded losses. The first operational unit with the Su-57 is the 23rd Guards Fighter Aviation Regiment, Tallinn, based near the manufacturing plant in Komsomolsk, Naamurie. However, not all the aircraft are assigned to combat units because, like it happens in the United States, some are assigned to training and test units. In this case, the 4th Center for Combat Employment and Personnel Training and the 929th State Flight Test Center. These two units still fly some of the prototypes, two of which seem to have been brought to the production standard. The low-rate production is one of the major criticisms of the Su-57. International sanctions and financial issues are often mentioned as a cause, but these are not important factors. The reality is much simpler. The final engine for the aircraft is not ready yet. The Saturn is the 30 engine flew on a prototype for the first time in 2017. In 2023, though, a Saturn executive declared that the engine was still a few years away, albeit it was just given the official production designation of AL-51F1. Current aircraft fly with the respectable but older AL-41F1. The Russian Air Force has openly declared that it is not willing to accept more aircraft with the old engine, which in turn poses the problem of keeping the manufacturing line open while waiting for the AL-51. How do I know? Well, it is enough to check the Russian sources. Uh, there is much more information in the public domain that you would expect. I usually make all the sources that I use in the videos available to channel members and patrons, so, well, this could be a good opportunity to start supporting the channel, if you can. The engine is, at this stage, the weakest point that is holding back the entire Su-57 project. The AL-41F1, which is currently installed on production aircraft, is the latest development of the AL-31F family that equips several Russian combat aircraft. The AL-41F1 produces 93 kN dry and 147 kN with afterburner. For comparison, the Pratt & Whitney F-119 installed on the F-22 should produce around 160 kN Newton with afterburner. So, while still an effective engine, it is clearly not ideal for the Su-57. The most important limitation is probably the Super Cruise, that is, the capability of flying above Mach 1 with no afterburner. The current Su-57 is Super Cruise capable, but not much above Mach 1 and probably not at low altitude. The aircraft should reach only Mach 1.3 while flying at high altitude, without afterburner. The AL-51 is designed to provide 108 kN dry and 167 kN with afterburner, while being about 30% lighter and about 18% more efficient than the AL-41. 
While it is inspired by the AL-41, the AL-51 is a clean slate design that uses new advanced materials and additive manufacturing. It was designed to be the engine that filled the technology gap with the West and possibly leaped ahead, but it is taking longer than expected to become fully operational. We don't know the details of what is not yet satisfactory, but it is clearly quite important if the entire Su-57 project is held back. And soon the Su-75 will be affected as well, because it is expected to use the same engine. So just to be clear, because you may have read something really off the charts on some sources, the Su-57 project is not being abandoned, nor it is an experimental aircraft with no practical deployment like some Western sources love to claim. It is accepted in service and it has been used in Ukraine, as we will see later. It has some issues, like most aircraft, which are not fully mature when they enter service. Yeah, unfortunately, there are a lot of commentaries about the Su-57, which are just inspired by prejudice against Russian technology and bias. This may even not be intentional in some cases, but the vision we have is often biased by the fact that most of us are confined within an algorithmic bubble that tends to serve us only one of the possible points of view. This is the reason why a tool like Ground News, which is sponsoring this video, is essential if you want to have a balanced perspective. Ground News is a website and an app that gathers related articles from more than 50,000 sources around the world in one place, so you can compare how different outlets cover the same subject. Every story comes with a clear breakdown of the political bias, credibility, ownership, and then headlines of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. You can learn more by clicking my link, ground.news slash millennium, or scanning the QR code here. Okay, let's make an example. If I go here and search for Russia, I am quickly presented with the Russian page. And among the news, among the stories being covered, I noticed this one. Russia's Shoigu visits Iran for security talks day after North Korean trip. And I can see that this story has been covered by a decent number of news outlets, about 18, more or less evenly distributed between the left, right, and center. Let's see what the left is saying. And, well, they are covering the news in relatively plain terms of Russia's Shoigu visits Iran for security talks days after going to North Korea. But if we click on the right, we see that Fox News says that top Russian official lands in Iran amid US and UK concerns over alleged nuclear deal. And here you can see how the spin is completely different as the nukes take center stage. Moreover, if you are interested to the conflict in general, Ground News also has specific subject pages to stay up to date, not only for Ukraine, but for many different subjects. Ground news is very important for my research since I try to be as factual and um, unbiased as I can about something that is often neither black nor white. Ground news helps me understand the bigger picture by providing comprehensive reporting from diverse sources. Now go to ground.news millennium or scan my QR code to subscribe today. If you sign up through my link, you'll get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all the features. I think Ground News is doing a great job and I hope you'll check them out. Please support the people who support me. So, the Su-57 is not going anywhere. The assembly line in Komsomorsk Namurye has been expanded in 2023 and the production increased as well. And in the summer of 2024, it has been announced that the further infrastructural improvements are happening on the same site. The reason being the Su-57M variant. The intention to produce a Su-57M has been known for a long time. The main feature of the M model will be the new engine, but this won't be ready for a while. The plan, announced in 2023, was to start the deliveries in 2025, but it seems that Saturn will need some more time. 
However, this is not the only improvement. We know that improvement work is being done on the N036 BLK radar. The BLK is a complex that literally has no equivalence in the world in terms of antennas and versatility. It has four X-band arrays and at least four L-band arrays. And no, these are not for IFF only, like some sources love to say. The Su-57 is the only fighter jet that has 360 degrees radar coverage. However, it is still the first generation of Russian AESA radars for fighters, so there is still a lot of room for improvement. One of the telltale signs is the size of the individual black boxes on the Su-57, which the Russians often paint light blue or grey, which tends to be larger if compared with the Western equivalents. And the same is true for the rest of the sensors and the electronic warfare suites. The Su-57 has one of the most complete sensor suites, featuring a wide range of electronic warfare and electro-optics subsystems. It seems that these components are still evolving and the final configuration will be reached only with the Su-57M. Sanctions are not expected to be a problem anymore because the work to make the aircraft electronics and the whole aircraft in general not dependent on foreign or unfriendly components started in 2014, when the first round of international sanctions happened. I expect that until Suhoi is ready for the production of the Su-57M, the production will be very slow just to keep the production line going. Intermediate configuration aircraft might be delivered and indeed the recent lot of September 2024 could be an intermediate configuration. However, there are other very interesting developments. If you look at this picture, I am sure you're noticing something strange. This is not a real picture, it is a rendering of the Su-57 with two-dimensional nozzles. That is, the nozzle, rather than having a round section, it has a rectangular shape with the largest side horizontal. Rather than moving around at 360 degrees, like the current AL-41 nozzles, they are just oriented up and down. In terms of maneuverability and overall effectiveness, they are a regression from the AL-41, but they have some other advantages. They are simpler, requiring less maintenance, they are lighter, reducing the aircraft weight, they are slightly less vulnerable to damage having fewer actuators, but perhaps the most interesting advantage is that they promote the mixing of the exhaust gases with the atmosphere, thus reducing the infrared plume. They are in the pipeline for an AL-51 upgrade in the future and Saturn is working on it. Personally, I'm not entirely sure that using this configuration would be a wise move since they already have a technologically superior and more capable solution, but, well, it will likely be a matter of compromises. So, you may have noticed that there is no dual-seater Su-57. The pilot conversion happens on simulators like for the F-35. The aircraft is considered easy to fly like other modern Russian designs. Sergei Bogdan, the main test pilot, in an interview said that the aircraft basically flies itself unless you need to do air combat maneuvers. The workload on the pilot is considered very low, leaving time for using the sensors and the weapons. However, a patent about a dual-seater variant has been filed in 2023. The patent explicitly mentions that the aircraft would require a second operator to control drones, released from the aircraft itself or just flying with it. It is impossible not to consider the S-70 Okotnik as a part of this picture. The Russian heavy drone is starting serial production this year, so we should start seeing it in Ukraine in 2025, albeit we all hope that the war will end sooner. However, Suhoi is not waiting for the dual-seater variant to develop other interesting solutions in this area. Pictures have emerged of a new type of drone called the S-71 Kilim. The pictures we have show what is clearly a test variant, painted in red with all the reference points. The development started in 2019 and Suhoi recently announced the start of the testing stage. 
It actually looks like a sort of a stealth cruise missile, but the weapon is much more a hybrid between a cruise missile and a loitering munition. The warhead is supposed to be modular and heavy enough to attack protected targets, but at the same time, the flight profile and the range are such to allow the weapon to loiter over the battlefield. It is guided by a data link with a ground station or the launching aircraft, and the controllers would be using the S-71 as they would do with a loitering munition orbiting an area on the battlefield trying to identify targets. On the prototypes we don't see an optical window, but the patent seems to suggest having some form of infrared terminal guidance. There's always the possibility that the news prism is opaque to light but transparent to the infrared, but yeah, can be sure. The interesting feature though is that if the data link is interrupted for whatever reason, the weapon has autonomous capabilities to recognize a target and attack it. How reliable such a system could be for ground attack is an open question, but it is surely an important addition. Even because the weapon actually relays back its own target identification to the operator, simplifying the job of the human controller. There is also another S-71 variant in development, the S-71M Monochrome. This is a variant designed to fit inside the Su-57 base, two in each bay for a total of four. It should have the same feature as the S-71, but in a different form factor, which honestly reminds me of the KH-69 missile. The KH-69 missile is another Su-57 specific weapon. It is a derivation of the older KH-59, once again designed to fit inside the Su-57 base. It has a range of at least 400 km, measured by the Ukrainians, and a warhead of about 300 kilos. And please note that the approximate range that the Russians declared when this missile was shown at an expo in 2022 was 290 km. So much for the Russians are always overclaiming narrative. The guidance is a combined system including GPS GLONASS, inertial navigation, and an electro-optical seeker like the KH-59 Mark II. The missile seems to have seen the first operational use in April 2024, and since then between 30 and 40 units have been either detected or the wrecks have been recovered by Ukraine at the time of writing. And Ukrainian reports actually point out how accurate the weapon is to attack fixed target. It is believed to be in the same class as the Storm Shadow or the Taurus. The identification of the KH-69 being in use in Ukraine gives us two very important clues. The first is that the Russians can manage the complex kill chains associated with this kind of weapons. In fact, if it has to use an electro-optic or infrared seeker for the terminal guidance, it must be fed with pictures processed in a way that the missile could use, which means that the pictures must be taken, must be stored in a database, must be made available and searchable by the planners, they must be processed in a standardized way, they must be transmitted to the unit executing the mission and loaded into the weapon, together with many other pieces of information that are required for the missile to actually work. This kind of complexity is something that only advanced countries can afford on a systematic scale. But the other clue that the use of KH-69 is giving to us is even more important. The Su-57 has actively seen combat in Ukraine. Reports of the Su-57 being used in Ukraine have emerged since March 2022, when the Russians explicitly mentioned it. It was mostly reports of the aircraft launching cruise missiles from a safe distance, not much different from what other Russian aircraft are doing. There was also a report of one or two air-to-air -air victories obtained with the R-37M, but this was never confirmed. However, in 2024, the very fact that several dozens of KH-69 attacks have been identified by the Ukrainians themselves means that the Su-57s are now regularly used for long-range attacks. And probably even more missions took place and the Ukrainians could not identify them. This seems a pretty solid record from my point of view, and the aircraft, well, it really looks like fully operational. And here I would like to address one of the most bizarre facts 
reported in the narrative around the Su-57. Reports emerged that the aircraft was escorted by Su-35s in its missions because the Russian Air Force was concerned about losing it. Several news outlets and commentators accepted this as true without scrutiny because, well, you know, the Russians are stupid and their technology is bad or bizarre for show sure and so on. Well, this narrative not only makes little sense, but if it did make sense, it would have some really concerning implications. So, having non-stealth fighters with a low observable aircraft sort of defeats the point. The Su-57 won't be the stealthiest of the fifth generation air fighters, but compared with the Su-35 it is basically invisible. Moreover, you add fighter escorts to defend from other aircraft. And since the Ukrainian Air Force is not a threat, why? You may say it could have been because of the electronic warfare pods on the Su-35, but the Su-57 has its own protection suite, which is even more advanced. You may say, well, that's proof that it doesn't work. Yeah, okay, but then why use the aircraft at all? But now, let's suppose it did happen. Let's suppose the Su-35s actually escorted the Su-57s. How did Ukrainian know? Their long-range fixed radars have all been destroyed at the beginning of the war. This is basically the destiny of every fixed installation in modern wars. How did they characterize the radar and the emission footprint of the Su-57 to be sure that it was indeed a Su-57? The only way they could would be through a NATO asset, but as far as we know, they all fly over NATO territory, very, very far from the supposed area of operations. Or are we implicitly admitting that a NATO electronic reconnaissance asset flew into Ukraine to do the job? Or even worse, that NATO personnel is managing some sort of ground-based electronic intelligence installation? That would be quite concerning. What do you think? Please, let me know in the comments below. So, what I believe, I have no way of proving this, but this is what I believe, is that a Rostec press release was misinterpreted. In the release where they stated that the Su-57 was participating to the special military operation, as they used to say, they also pointed out that the aircraft is doing it together with other Rostec products like the Su-35 and the Su-34. This was interpreted as if the Su-35 was supposed to escort the Su-57, and since it was fitting inside the mainstream Western narrative, it was accepted without scrutiny. Okay, after all of this, at the end of the video, I'm quite sure that there will be plenty who will say that I am just a Russian shill, that I'm paid by the Kremlin, that I have dinner with Putin and so on. Just for legal reason, I'm none of those things, okay? None. But, yes, I am partial to the Su-57, not because I am pro-Russian, far from it, but because it is the only aircraft in the last 30 years that has shown some out-of-the-box thinking. It is an aircraft designed with attention to the platform. It is designed to be fast, maneuverable and long-ranged. It featured the only aerodynamic innovation of the last 30 years in combat aircraft, that is the Levcoms. It is a real aeronautical engineering masterpiece, and I praise ingenuity wherever I see it. And I humbly suggest you do the same. So thank you very much for watching this video. It was a pleasure and a an honor having had your attention. I have to thank you, the Discord server community that provided some very interesting pictures for this video. And if you want to join, please find the link in the description. Another big thank you to my friend Daniele Faccioli, who is a professional aircraft photographer, for letting me use some of his pictures of the Su-57. And the usual enormous thank you to all those who are supporting the channel by being a member on Patreon or by donating by other means. Today you can support the channel on GoFundMe as well, that is connected to a book that I'm trying to prepare. Scan the QR code or check the link in the description if you're interested. And if you can materially support the channel, which is totally, totally, totally fine, please subscribe if you haven't yet and interact with the channel in any way you prefer because that helps immensely with the algorithms. So this is the end. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.